know me, some of you guys don't, Jenna Orlandini, uh, one of the coaches at San Gabriel. And we have the privilege of having uh, Tama Miyashiro, if you guys can see, um, talking to us today, little Q&A sesh. Uh, a little <laughs> background on Tama. Um, she is a very decorated athlete, and I'm going to mess this up pretty badly because she has got so many awards. Um, but in college, oh she went to uh, University of Washington, uh, where she was three-time All-American, and she holds the uh, uh, all-time digs leader at the University of Washington, and she was also um, the 2007-2008 Defensive Player of the Year. She... Um, did a lot in college, and then after that, she went on to play professionally and for Team USA. Um, after, or I guess during that time, she did a little thing called went to the Olympics. So I'm gonna show off my shirt here. This is a shirt we made. I don't know if you guys know this. I went to uh, the University of Washington, and when Tama was chosen um, to go to London and represent the USA, uh, we got these shirts made and we we're just so proud of her. It was so much fun. Great time. Um, and she won a silver medal there. Pretty great. And then uh, after that, she played for a little bit longer and then went on to coaching. And she's uh, now the assistant coach for the U.S. women's team. She has coached at the high school level. She's coached at the collegiate level. Um, as the volunteer assistant at Arizona State, she's even coached professionally over in Germany. So she knows a thing or two about volleyball. So we're really excited to have her here, Tama, and we're going to start with some questions. Perfect. Okay. So uh, just can you tell us about how you got into volleyball? You're from Hawaii. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us what that was like? And uh, shout out Brent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you uh, just talk to us about how you got into volleyball and what that was like for you? Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for having me, guys. Um, so I I started playing at a young age, uh, mostly because my family was, um, yeah, everyone played sports and my mom played volleyball, my sister one of my brothers and um, yeah, so I pretty much grew up in a gym. My dad was an athletic director in high school, um, out of high school. And so I actually ended up going to the same high school, but we were just a sports family for sure. And so um, I think I played on my first like Oregon club team at like nine uh, with like 12 year olds. And, you know, of course I was the youngest uh, probably the smallest at the time, but uh, my mom coached that team. So that was when I first uh, started playing club volleyball and like organized. Uh, but up until then, it was just a lot of pepper and playing with my cousins and family and all that. And so I actually started playing soccer, basketball, baseball, even a little bit of tennis before that. So I actually started volleyball last. But uh, yeah, ever, ever since I started, I realized that I don't like running. So I chose <laughs> volleyball, <laughs> uh, volleyball won. Um, and so I played club volleyball all throughout high school and uh, also played basketball for my school until I was a junior in high school. And then ended up going to pl uh play college ball too so started off pretty young and definitely because of family can you tell us where you played club volleyball yeah I played for a couple different teams um when I first started playing I was playing for a club called a6 rainbows and they they were a pretty big club had some history also played there <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, so I played there and then a couple years into it, my mom made a club. Um, it was kind of like one of those things where, she, you know, if I make the club, then I can, you know, I determine who's coaching and I don't have to pay club fees. And um, I get to provide a place for my daughter and her friends to play. And so there was a couple teams that I played on that, you know, clubs don't exist anymore. Uh, and then in high school, 
I don't know, Brent, is Impact still around? I know ASICS is, right? Um, ASICS is still, I don't think. Yeah. uh, yeah. So that might be the only one that people have heard of. But um, yeah, in, let's say, oftentimes I played with my friends. So I knew we kind of stayed in the same group. And a lot of us actually played basketball and volleyball. We would like play each other at basketball at the basketball game and then show up later at volleyball practice <laughs> and be on the same team. So, um, I mean, that's just, that kind of speaks to how small Oahu is, but, um, so yeah, I was not only family, but a lot of friends and, uh, it was pretty tight knit back at home. How was, uh, the recruiting process for you in high school? Considering yeah, it was I, a smaller club, maybe how, how did, how did that <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm probably the example that you don't want to hear of, but I will tell you so you could learn from me. Uh, so I, you know, I am playing in Hawaii. It's, it's small. And um, at that time, we were only traveling once a uh, club season to play in a tournament. And that was always at the end. And so we weren't, we just weren't out there as much as some club teams from Hawaii are now. And so, um, yeah, it was, I would say I did not take a super active route in the recruiting, probably could have done better. No, not probably should have done better. And so it was already probably the end of my junior year and the start of my senior year where it kind of hit me that, um, the couple of schools that were interested in me, I wasn't super pumped up to play there if that makes sense and not not in a way like I was I thought I was better than the team but um, I actually played as an outside hitter and a setter in high school and a lot of them wanted me to do that at the school so they they saw me hit and set and there were smaller schools and they wanted me to do this kind of like the same thing there but I I I really didn't want to I wanted to be a libero so um it's you know it's kind of hard to be looked at as libero when you never play libero and so uh yeah it was probably winter ish time of my senior year and my cousin who was coaching me at the time was like all right this is like ridiculous um we need to do something about it and uh my very relaxed uh persona <laughs> Uh, was like yeah I probably should do something about it and so she helped me create like a video you know and um, I'm dating myself but back then you guys it was like a dvd and so <laughs> she she got a couple of matches and uh, burnt it on a dvd and burned then just, it. Those yeah <laughs> um, made that that CD. dvd label to you older people know what I'm talking about but um so we just sent them out to like all the big volleyball schools um it not you know probably if I was a little more proactive I probably would have sent them to more schools but at the time I knew I play volleyball so that was like kind of my starting point and um you know it's so late in the game uh especially for like like let's be honest I'm only five seven and so if you want to be libero, there's usually only a handful of them on a team, one, maybe a couple of DSs. So just opportunities are slim. And um, yeah, one school wrote back and it wasn't, oh, awesome. VHS. Armando's VHS. <laughs> um, I think maybe one version of mine was on VHS. I don't, I don't know. Um, and so a lot of schools were like, Hey, thanks for sending your video in, but, uh, we're, we're filled for this next season. Um, you know, if you get into the school, then let us know. And, uh, yeah, that wasn't, yeah, that, yeah, that wasn't happening for me. And there was just one school that wrote back, um, and it was UW. And at the time they didn't have a scholarship available for that next season. Obviously it's, it's like, I don't know, six months away. And so um, they said, would you like to come on a visit? Because uh, there was there was a special like circumstance with one of the players at the time that she was trying to get another year of eligibility. And so that wasn't like a final decision yet. And so their idea was, hey, come on a visit. And in case um, 
you know, she doesn't get granted that year, then you, we would look to give you that scholarship. And so I went on a visit. Uh, mind you, I went on three other visits to schools, uh, small schools that like, yeah, they're not really super known for volleyball. Um, and so when I went to UW, I really liked everything about um, Seattle, about the campus, about the program, about the staff, the players. And so I kind of had a feeling like I, I really want to go there. But, um, you know, coming from a big family and paying out-of-state tuition is like not the best. And so my family figured out a way. I actually ended up walking on my first year and then was on scholarship after that. So I forgot what question one was. Is this your question? Yeah, we'll just but, talk about your recruiting process. Cause oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, so like you walked on and you, you know, were yeah. at risk. Were you looking only at Division One schools? Um, yeah, at the, I, I was definitely open to hearing, like, about any school, but I think I felt like I wanted to be challenged a lot and play – at a program that was, um, yeah, competing for at least conference championships, not necessarily national championships. So uh, that was uh, kind of in my mind um, how I approached it. But for sure, you know, you, you get that late in the recruiting game. You, you can't really be too picky. But I got lucky. So learn from me, ladies. Can you mm -hmm. talk to us about that transition from um, being a setter hitter to a libero yeah so I um so where I grew up and and the teams that I played on uh from Hawaii I was probably consistently like I don't know second or third tallest uh, but I had pretty good ball control and so um I played on some teams where like one of my best one of my best friends was like other person that was hitting and setting and so kind of just worked um and I did that because I loved playing defense I loved hitting at the time I loved it but like once I stopped doing it I was like why did I even like that <laughs> um and I like setting um just having some you know you're always involved in the play type of thing and you can kind of run the offense and uh, be in a position to run the team. So I uh, really liked that at the time, but um, I actually just really liked playing defense and I really liked passing, which is why my last year of club, I was like, I kind of want to be a libero. So, um, you know, it was a pretty new position, even like when we were in high school, Brent. So it was like, I did play libero in high school uh, we just, it just passed when I was in the front row type of thing. So um, I actually got to UW and um, so my highlight tape, you know, like I had like setting on there and I had not much passing that had hitting whatever. And so I actually got to Washington and I had an ink that I was going to be a setter, but I don't know why. I think I was just so excited to go there. I didn't like really know what was happening. And the first day of preseason at our, um, you know, when the first day we meet, we don't play. Right. Uh, my head coach at the time, Jim was like, Hey, you have to come 20 minutes early tomorrow because you have to do setter tutoring. And I was like, I'm setting. <laughs> I don't know why like, I got, it was like kind of confusing, but granted if you were to ask Jim, he probably wasn't confusing at all. But in my mind, maybe I was just like wishful thinking, you know. And so um, that first year, I ended up setting. Um, and the, the starting setter, like the older setter was Courtney Thompson. So she also, she played in two Olympics and we're like really good friends now too. But uh, it was actually a pretty cool experience because my only job was to set the other side and compete. That's like the only thing that I was told to do is just compete and you're going to run this other side. And if you end up beating out Courtney, then we're going to play you. But if not, we're going to redshirt you. So it was a pretty interesting um, mindset that I had for that first year. But I always looked at it as I was competing and that I need to be ready to play at, at any time, at any match, I need to play. Um, you know, say she got injured or she got sick. Um, I, I had to be able to like go in there and just run the team. And so it was, 
it was actually a nice mindset because that made me show up every single day and um, just stay engaged because I think it's, it's sometimes easy if you, if you have like an idea in your mind that you might not play, it's really easy to like, you know, not train hard and um, not care, take care of all the little details. So um, just that possibility alone kept me um, like just staying sharp. And then, uh, so that first year we won um, a national title. And uh, after we, so we lost a libero, our starting libero, libero and our DS. So really big contributors to the national title. And um, in practice, my first year, like all I was trying to do was keep the rally going. So I, I just told myself, any ball that comes to you, you have to dig and just do a good job setting. And so I think my defense kind of drew attention. <laughs> and so since they knew I passed in high school, Jim, that first winter, um, he was like, hey, come to practice. And I just want to see you pass a couple balls. And so I um, basically passed the exact opposite of the technique that he was teaching. But I had some good control. And so I ended up training as a libero in that winter. And then I played libero after that. So that was kind of like the transition, um, which was, it was pretty cool because I was one of the few that could set as a libero. A lot of people are bump setting now. And um, it, it's, a, it's a nice little additional skill that I had um, to kind of make me a more well-rounded uh, libero. So that oh was my. nice. Can you give some incoming uh, college freshmen um, some advice on how to give themselves like a better chance of playing? Yeah. Incoming freshmen. Um, first, I think you got to come prepared and ready to go. So make sure you're fit, make sure you're strong. I think the, the biggest part that, you know, if I remember is I did some good preparation. So when I showed up, I could focus on volleyball, like, for sure, you're going to be sore. You're going to be a little tired. But I was in good enough shape that I, when I showed up my first year, I felt like I could at least kind of hang with the team and I wasn't falling behind because of fitness. So that would be my first thing is make sure you show up ready to go. Now, that's different for the state we're in right now, but um, ideally would be nice to show up ready to go. And... Um, I didn't do this when I was this age, but now that I'm a coach, I would figure out um, something about how the team plays. So their systems, whether it's contacting the coach, hey, I don't even know if this is legal. This, I don't know if this is good advice, but just figuring out something that the team values or something about their system that can help you integrate to the team. And so like an example would be, um, maybe you learn a couple of things about how they pass, you know, there's right now the state that we're in, so many coaches are doing like some type of like, I don't know, webinar or video or something. Um, I try to like get as much info as you can about the team that you're about to go to, because that's only going to help you get on board faster. So if there's some of those things that you can get rid of, um, like, before you even get there, then that's huge. And so the equivalent to my job now would be before, uh, let's say, a libero joins us, I send them a video and a couple keys of how we pass and video on our team. And so the hope is that they get a, like a good mental image and some good um, like visual representations of what they're going to do when they get here. So I would, I would try to learn about their team. Um, if it's possible to connect with some people um, on the team. And so, I don't know, maybe the captain, maybe you could get the number or contact info for someone on the team so you can kind of get to know some of them. I think huge, like you just want to set yourself up so that all these little other things can be taken care of so that when you show up, for the first day, you can literally just play. And I think that's, that's a part of that transition that's really hard is there's just so many things that you have to do. But I think you can mitigate some of that by just being a little more prepared. That's awesome. 
Can you um, talk to us a little bit about what you learned um, in college that better prepared you for professional and just the opportunity to play for the USA? Yeah, totally. Um, I think one thing that really helped me was that I was, uh, or something that I valued was being a learner. And so uh, I had to kind of revamp or like, I don't know, not redo or relearn, but change a lot of my technique actually. And um, the system that we played in college kind of simplified a lot of things that I did with my technique. And, um, you know, I had played a ton of volleyball, which is really good. And so I just had to stay open to some of the things that I was being told. And I had to learn fast. Um, as I said earlier, like I, I got thrown into the fire. Like I was in a position as a freshman where I was practicing every single minute of the day. Like, so I had to learn on the go. I had to learn how to set new, completely new hitters. And even though they're all really physical and they have a lot of range, um, you're, you know, they're just taking the ball at a different place and they're a lot faster and all these things. And so um, I think that was big part of it because had I gone in there and just said, oh, I can play volleyball, like I have such good ball control or whatever, I can play defense, um, I don't think that would have helped me because I would have probably stayed or even gotten worse because everybody else is better. So I tried to go into that situation just with an open mind and um, I was big on journaling. and so. Uh, I made sure I always had a notebook and I was writing down everything that I learned because uh, it was just a lot of information. And if you wait until, you know, four days later to be like, oh yeah, that's what we did on Monday. Like you would just wasted time. So I try to write things down. I tried to process them. Um, and that was a process I had to get better at. I didn't do that in high school. And so um <laughs> Just, just trying to make sure that everything I did learn, I, I kept. And I, even as a coach, but especially as a player, like, got really pissed at myself if I had to be, like, given the same directions twice. Like, I was like, Tama, like, be better, yeah. <laughs> listen, and, like, adjust type of thing. So that was, that's also just kind of my personality. But um, what else? I think physically, I had to get a lot stronger. I thought I was pretty strong and um, just building a good base. So, you know, there's, there's just some big lifts that we do, Olympic lifts, um, that I had to get really good at. I had to put on some muscle because the load that I was taking in college and then eventually professionally was just different. And so I didn't shy away from the weight room. I had to go in and do extra because I um, – I was just doing a lot, like, um, so preparing myself in that. And there's, there's a lot of people that can help with that, which is great. You know, that, that journey, you're not on by yourself. I think there's, there's enough plans by now that people can follow and that will help you. And just going to the professional game, a lot of it's on us. And so we have a strength coach and all that, but when we go to play professionally, we have a strength coach that could barely speak English. And I had like a, an Italian strength coach who was like 80, but apparently he was one of the best in Italy. And he came to coach me in Azerbaijan. And it was so much like I couldn't understand his writing. And so he had to draw the figures out for me, like what we're doing, because he couldn't, he didn't have enough time in the workout to show me everything because he was busy. So I had to have some type of like knowledge to know this is important for me and my position, my legs and my lower body have to be strong. I have to have a strong core because I need to hold these different positions really low and be able to control the ball. So um, the physical part was big, but I, I think uh, there's, there's people, there's lots of people that can help with that. That's awesome. We've got some questions going on on the side. I'm going to read a few of them off. Yeah. Uh, from uh, Jen Garner, how did you stay mentally tough even when you were not playing your best? Oh, great question. Uh, I think the I experienced some of that as a professional. Actually, I um, 
I went through this uh, I, big injury and uh, coming back, I didn't really feel myself. I know part of it was to trying to get back to the same fitness level or better um, because that, that helps a lot with just being able to move and respond to some things that we see at the professional level. And so I didn't feel good, but I also felt like I was one trying to be too perfect and two, I wasn't, um, well, I guess not completely different thing, but I just wasn't giving myself enough credit. And so I had to step back. I had to watch video because video is very non, uh, or it's a very objective way to look at yourself. So I watched a lot of video. I watched video of myself from before. And the, the goal with that was just to see um, myself doing things well. And so not so much to compare what I was like at the time to what I was before, because it's different when you, you have a big injury, you know, you're trying to work back. So it was just to see like when I was making some really nice angles and I was doing some really good things and I was playing uh, clean volleyball, then this is what I was doing. So those were nice reminders of what that looked like. Um, I think also I got better at, um, some of my routines that I would go through, let's say before a serve, I relied on those more. And what that did was that helped me put myself in a position where I was calm and kind of approaching a play the same way every time. And that, that consistency helped me as a player to approach the next play. So we, we often taught how the margins are thin at the highest level and at least for those things that you can actually control, which is your preparation, which is your routine before a play. Um, if I, I found that if I did a good job with that, I'd put myself in a better position than um, trying to rely, rely on something else. So trying to put my efforts to things I could control. I tried to connect with my teammates. I, I played with a lot of really cool teammates and I think they helped me a lot with that. Um, and I think that's a big part of why I like volleyball so much, but, um, you know, the, the tendency and I see it, I saw it as a player and I, I also see it as a coach is that when we aren't doing good, the tendency is to get closed off and, and become more about yourself. Um, but I think the better thing to do is do the opposite and try to help and um, you'll come back around. I always believe that. Uh, but it's it's hard. You you think everyone's looking at you, and you think everyone's judging you, and you think everyone thinks this and that. But the reality is, uh, we're we're going through the same thing, and we've all been through it too. And I think that's one thing to remember is, if we always played our best and felt the best, like we would all have gold medals by now. But that ain't even close to what is actually <laughs> happening. So, to to uh, let yourself off the hook every now and then, and um, be easy on yourself I think is good yeah um, so can we we're going to transition here a little bit can you talk about um, how you got into coaching um, you coached high school college professional now for the USA team can you talk about how you got into that position? yeah yeah for sure so um, I actually and I don't know if I've actually ever told them this but Tui and Keno are big reasons why I like coaching and got into coaching. Um, so our assistant coach is from UW. Uh, I love playing for our head coach too. And that just sounded like I didn't really care about that, but <laughs> I, I loved our staff a lot. Um, I think the, the biggest thing is I, 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 I feel like they helped me and they, but they cared about me as a person. And I think that translated into my volleyball. And so I was like, wow, I could be a coach. Like they're so like impactful, you know, that I was like, wow, that'd be cool to be that impactful to somebody else. That was kind of my thinking. Uh, and then as I got older, I saw how many hours head coaches are putting in, you know, and it was like scary. So I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. But anyway, um, after I was done playing, I wanted to see if I would like coaching. I wasn't actually completely sure because I had spent like uh let's see started at yeah a long time you guys playing volleyball 
And so I, I know, I know I love volleyball. It's not that I'm burnt out, but, um, you know, I, I wasn't really sure what it all meant because, uh, the only examples that I had were people who did it in a way that it, you know, it's very time consuming. Um, I think to do it right, you have some people that are almost kind of crazy about it and coaching is probably, I mean, I haven't done many other jobs, but it's pretty selfless. Um, so I, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who just got a head coaching job at Arizona state. And so I, I was like, Hey, what do you think about me helping you as a volunteer? Um, I wanted to kind of throw myself into it to see what I thought of it. So that's how I ended up there. Um, and I liked a few parts of it and really didn't like some parts. So even after that, I still wasn't really sure actually, but I really enjoyed teaching. So um, being able to share some knowledge with a player and see them figure something out is a really rewarding thing for me. And so uh, that, I was pretty excited about that part, like to see some of these kids um, execute some skills that they weren't quite to do before they got to, or before like I got there and saw video of them and whatever was, was pretty cool. Um, and so after, after that season, so that was in 2016, I went home for Christmas break and I was kind of at this point where I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so that's kind of scary. <laughs> and uh, what ended up happening was I went to visit some family and still was, I was talking to a lot of people like their transition from professional sports to their life after that, um, or their careers after that to close family friends that were, were doing some things that I was interested. Um, I started a foundation with my friend Courtney and we were doing some uh, volunteer work and like a close family friend does a lot of that. And so, you know, I was, I was just trying to see, like, I know I like doing, um, I'm not sure that it has to involve like high level volleyball, but I was very open to like anything. And so about, I think three weeks later, uh, our head coach Karch Kirai called me and asked me if I'd like even consider being a coach. So I had stayed in touch with him like, that whole fall that I was helping Arizona state. Um, and I think, you know, you're probably like, wait, you were a volunteer and then now you're being asked to coach the national team. So uh, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't know is just Karch's approach to learning and how much he values um, that in his players and his staff in himself. And so he knew that I could learn fast. He knew that I was very, um, like I loved USA volleyball and what it stood for. Um, I had, you know, some history since I just had done playing, uh, been done playing. So for sure he took a, a risk on me being a young coach, but I think, um, as people get to figure out more things about what Karch values in his staff, I think it makes, it actually makes more sense than it seems like from the outside. So in that respect, I, it was easy for me to um, kind of test. Like I wanted to be challenged. I realized that about myself and I knew I could learn. And so um, that's how I got on board with USA. And so I started like February of 2017 with the team. And then here I am now. That's such a cool story, Tama. Thanks for sharing that. Um, this next question comes from uh, Spartacus McGee. Um, how has the prep for the Olympics changed mm -hmm. now that it's in 2021? Yeah, we are, we're actually kind of figuring that out as we go, to be honest. Um, obviously, we don't, any, we don't have anything to model this um, after. So I think a couple of important things that make our situation unique is that we have professional athletes who were all over the world a month ago, or I guess maybe five weeks ago. So first we had to get them all back. Um, now they play for these professional clubs that pay them a pretty good salary. So 
for them um, when presented with like, oh, this thing might get crazy. I want to go home. Their clubs are like, oh, yep, get out of here. Um, you know, they they stop getting paid at that second. And just looking down the line, this is probably better for my health, um, for my mental state. Uh, I get to be with family, so I'm out of there. So some girls left their pro club teams pretty quickly. Some of them, it took a little bit longer. Some, uh, some leagues, uh, professional leagues in Europe, continue to play, actually, for a couple of weeks into this. And so, you know, we were already in lockdown, like in California. And we had, I think, three ladies playing matches in Turkey still. So we're managing all these different things from afar. And when you really think about it, we have very little say in what they do because they're, they're not our place the whole year round. So um, they had to work with their agents and their club managers to figure out what was best for them. And so there was a point where we pretty much got everyone back. Um, we're, we still don't have two girls back and they're very unique situations, but it's all back and our players are either at their parents' house, at their own houses, or with friends or, or something like, uh, but they're all over. So we have people in the Midwest, we have people in the East Coast, um, a, a bunch in California, and we are having like some Zoom workouts with our strength coach. We are having um, guest speakers come in once a week to talk to our group. Um, and we're trying to figure out the volleyball part. And it, the reason why we're, we're pretty sensitive to the timing of it is um, these girls play volleyball all year round at the highest level that it's like possible. And so to be able to decompress, you know, there's, there's some players that probably would have stopped playing after this Olympics. And so you were changing their whole preparation for the last four years and you're saying, oh, we're just going to add one more year. And, you know, they have to stay healthy. They, and with these circumstances, you know, I think a handful of them have good gyms. But, like, otherwise, like, I think one girl has, like, one band. So, can you imagine, like, a little over a year from now, we have to be playing our best volleyball. And so, that takes a toll on um, everyone just a little bit different. So, we're trying to manage that and uh, be cognizant of just where all our girls are at. So that's, that's the biggest thing that we're trying to figure out right now. And, um, you know, sooner or later, we're going to have to dive into more volleyball and we're going to have to start watching a lot of video and talking about some of our goals for the next year. But right now it's, it's, um, it's pretty low key right now. So that would be kind of where our girls are at right now. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Um, this next question comes from, um, one of our players on our 14 team. I mm -hmm. uh, hear a lot about the setter hitter connection. Mm -hmm. What what's an important element of a setter libero connection and relationship? A uh, good question. I man, I was really lucky because I played with a lot of good setters that were able to. Um, I don't know. We we had a lot of good relationships. So I think the the biggest thing. Uh, for example, one of our setters that was on the national team pretty much the entire time I was, was Courtney. And she happens to also be my best friend and we played college ball together. Right. Uh, but I would say some of the things that stick out to me about her would be um, she's always, how do you say it? she's, she's the person that was like, Hey, Tama, just give me a one pass four feet off. So just a simple phrase like that, what that does for a passer is it allows them to kind of frame um, their, obviously they're passing, but what she was telling me is you don't need to be perfect. I can do my job even if you're not perfect. So Jim, a perfect pass is more like two to three feet off, right? Uh, but there were so many times in training and in matches that she would just come up to me and say, hey, just give me four feet. And so what she was doing was she was also putting some responsibility on herself that like, you do your job and like, I got the rest kind of thing. And so that support was huge. Um, I think oftentimes we, we try to ask for perfection 
or we strive for per- perfection. And I, I think it actually does some damage sometimes. Um, it, when we're trying to be perfect, we don't play loose and we don't play free. And I, I think that's kind of counterproductive. And so uh, she was really good at that. Some of the other setters that I've played with um, were very good communicators and they, they were able to keep us on track they were able to kind of front load um, the play or what's about to happen in a match. They had always, but a lot of them were our leaders. Um, But some of our best setters weren't our captains or anything, but when we were on the court, they were leading. And so making sure we're always in a huddle, making sure everyone knew what we're supposed to be doing type of thing. Um, But I think, this, in my opinion, the setter and the libero are very important on the court, and they um, they need to kind of tag team. I think it it's very helpful when they're on the same page, and they can work well together. Um, and it's also nice when you do pass and they save your butt. So it's always it's good to be nice. But um, but no, I, I think that was the biggest thing that stood out from court was um, she she demanded a lot for me, but it was never perfection. It was just, Hey, just be good. And I'll, I got the rest. I'll be good for everybody else. So that was cool. Cool. Um, this next question is, uh, do you prefer playing or coaching more? Uh, okay. I will be the first one to tell you that it, it's harder to teach. I think, um, playing, you know, there's, the one thing about playing is you're always in a, in a sense on. So you are always thinking about uh, what you're doing and how it's going to affect your performance. Right. And it's not that you get to take more breaks as a coach. It's not that, but um, it can consume you as a professional. And I think I had, I feel like I had pretty good balance, you know, with that type of thing, but um you know, when I would go home for a break to Hawaii, like I always had to be planning um, what I was uh, going to eat, when I was going to work out, how I was going to work out, um, about my sleep, you know, like when I go to my, when I went to my pro team, um, you know, I was there and pretty much you have to perform. That is like your job. And so, figuring out what you have to do to do that at a high level for the entire year is really taxing. Right. And it's it's really cool. It's really, really rewarding, obviously. Um, As a coach, it's, it's really cool uh, to be a part of the process of helping your, your girls get better and giving them some tools to improve. Right. And to me, I really look at matches as a test of that. It, not in a way that I put all of that on my shoulders, but it's a really cool to see the work that you've both done together and where it's at. So it's like a really cool thing, but you know, it's, it's not like I'm like sitting back on the bench, like, Oh, good job. Or, Oh, we're not good at that. But um, there's some, there's some type of break in there that you get to kind of sit back and, and just watch and, and see. So, um, yeah, for me, heart, uh, yeah, it's it's tough, but it's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to let either Brent or Jez ask the rest of the questions for about six or seven more minutes. So you guys can pick whichever. We've got a lot of people that put in a ton of questions. This is awesome. Yes. So Jez and Brent, you guys can pick the rest of them. Uh, we'll go for about five or six more minutes, Tama. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. Your answers are awesome. I want to just pick your brain, but all right, Jez, Brent, you guys want to ask some more of those questions? Brent, you want to go first or you want me to go? You go first. Okay, I've got, I've actually got quite a bit. So I know we put in a lot of questions into the chat, guys. Sorry if we don't get to get to all of them. Um, We'll do our best. Uh, Let's see what we got here. Um, You know, we'll start off nice and easy. What do you like to do in the off season? Oh, uh, I don't really have one, but uh, I like 
uh, I miss my family a lot. So when I get to go home, it's really nice. Um, but I actually, truthfully, I don't really have an off season. Uh, I'm not like, we're not like college season or schedule. And so um, I'm trying to think of what I do for fun. If that's probably what this person's asking. They're probably more likely. Um, 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 I majored in art, so I like art, but I don't really get to do a lot of art. Uh, so that's something that I'm interested in. I sometimes I like to, I know I travel a lot, but sometimes I like to travel too. So I like to go to places where we don't really go for volleyball. So I've been in a couple of cool places on the off seasons or the short breaks that I've had. So I would say travel. Okay. Uh, did you like playing in college more or USA slash professionally more? Ooh, that's a, that's a good one. Um, totally different beasts. I would say, uh, at the time I thought my college experience was like the best thing ever, like ever. And then I started playing the national team and that was like the best thing ever. So, um, I guess the only thing that I, I would say is, you know, at, at the time, and I didn't, uh, in college, I wasn't really sure that I was ever capable of being on the national team until later in my college career. And then even when I got to the national team, I, I think in the back of my, your mind, you want to go to the Olympics because that's why you're there. And that was like a real thought. I don't think it was really possible until the year of the Olympics. And so that's a pretty cool, um, that was like a pretty cool journey for me is like you just put your head down and work and try to be good for your team and try to get better and then um, keep grinding it out. And next thing you know, you're, you put yourself in a position to try to make a team. So that was, that was nice, but yeah, totally different things. Um, obviously you've played in a ton of big matches. Uh, how, how do you personally like to prepare for those? Uh, now, okay, okay, so now that I'm older, my advice would be to do the opposite. It would be to not view any of them as big matches. And I think that's like, you're probably, you guys might be thinking like, uh, that's like impossible. Like, that's why you have championships. Like, I understand that. But um, the biggest, like, piece of advice, I think, for um, actually like a real life example would be when I play, uh, played and coached in Germany, um, they have this thing called the German Cup, and it's like the biggest thing ever. Like, it's it's like one match. You have to play into it. It's a single elimination tournament, um, the winner of Germany, obviously. And um, the, the final is called German Cup, and it's a huge thing in Germany. People come from all over to watch. It's a big deal. And what happens is, people would hype up this one match so much and that would force them and actually wouldn't even notice, but they would go about it completely different than any other game. And so what happens when you do that is you kind of, you put yourself in a position where you're no longer like doing what you know how, like you know how to do and what you do well. And there's just, to me, there's just no way to compete at a high level when you're, all of a sudden changing some routine or all of a sudden you're doing something different. And so I understand for sure. Like if our team makes the gold medal match for sure, I'm going to be so stoked and I'm whatever. But um, I guess in my experience coaching, especially coaching in that team, there were some parts of our club surrounding the girls that were like, Oh, we have to do it. It's the cup. Oh, we have to do this. Oh, we must do this. And it's such a, like toxic language to have when you are trying to be really good. Um, and so I'd be pretty, pretty hesitant to even go there. And, you know, I think I may have saw some parents on there. I think it's, it's sometimes um, the people that are around these athletes that need to help them with it, you know, like don't all of a sudden go eat a completely different meal right before the game, because it's the biggest game of the year you know like um and sometimes you can't do that because people are just excited about volleyball but um 
otherwise I try to stick to my routine. That would be my short answer is try to stick to my routine and do the things that I know I need to do. And as I got older, that list of things got shorter. And mostly because when we play in those international matches, um, sometimes the protocol before the games are different. And sometimes you play at like 1 p.m. And sometimes you play at 9. And so if I got this like entire nap series that I have to do or like this entire thing and I don't have time, like I'm going to be so messed up. So um, there's a couple of things on that list. And I would urge you guys to figure those out. And as you get older, it'll be more refined. But try to stick to what you normally do. Good answer. Uh, just a few more, Tom, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. What do you think the most important factor is in passing or as a passer? Uh, just to be – just work to be nice and quiet and, and make uh, really quiet moves. And um, a lot of that has to do with our eyes and what we see and making sure that we're looking at server contact. Um, I think it's – it's a, a part of passing that sometimes we, I don't know, we kind of look past and we don't spend too much time, but I, I make sure we know what we're supposed to be looking at, um, trying to get as much information early from a server, uh, and that's going to help us a lot. But other than that, just, you know, not a ton of extra movement. We're not doing all these extra shuffles or arm bends. Uh, we're just trying to keep it simple. And I think that's like the best way to describe it because, you know, we could talk about technique for like another hour, but that would be huge is making sure our eyes are right and then keeping all our moves really quiet and simple. Okay. Maybe the last one. Uh, what are your biggest takeaways from your career as both a player and a coach? Who great. Um, great question. A couple of my – big takeaways uh, when I was finishing playing or actually no kind of in the middle of my professional career I learned a really big lesson um, while I was playing in Azerbaijan and if you don't know where that is it's okay because I also didn't know and I was like 22 years old um, but I played a professional season there and um, basically I, I went there after London so the season directly after the Olympic games, I went there and, um, you know, sometimes when you play professional or when you sign with professional teams and agents and stuff, uh, they aren't as detail oriented as you would like them to be. And so I went there and wasn't really communicated, um, fully what I was about to get into. And so I show up and I like, find out that I'm actually on a tryout. And so I like flew across the world and this guy who barely speaks English says, by the way, you have another girl living with you tomorrow. That's going to be the same position as you. And you're going to try out for one spot. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So um, the big lesson there was just that coming off of an Olympic games and um having some expectations of just really anything really hurt me. And so one of, and this is, I didn't start this, but one of uh, Karch's big things is to set low expectations and have high hopes. And so uh, when he first told me that I was actually at Washington and I was like, are you serious? Like we have high expectations, but what, what we mean by that is just, um, you know, there's, there's, ha there has to be a sense of gratitude in everything that we do. And, you know, in my case, it was a lack of communication. Um, but even when I was there, um, expecting that they would communicate to me, like how I thought I needed to be expecting that, um, they cared about what I was, uh, what they were serving at the restaurant to serve as lunch, um, uh, expecting that, they cared a lot about the athletes and, you know, would have these things. And what I quickly learned was that um, the only thing that did was kind of set me up for like failure essentially, because it's really hard to live up to the expectation. And so, you know, I had gone in there and approached it like, all right, I'm going to go to Azerbaijan and I am just going to 
try to help this team. I'm going to, I know I'm good at volleyball, so I'm going to try to do and play my best and we'll see where it goes. That would have been a much better mindset going into a very, um, I don't know, a situation with so many unknowns. And so playing on the national team, there's so many unknowns because you're, you're good. Um, everyone's a good player but you don't know if you're going to make an Olympic team until three or three weeks before the team leaves. So operating with low expectations and high hopes, I think is a big, is a big one. And then um, <clears throat> someone told me that I was in a position to write my story. And so what that did was put a lot on myself and um, you know, there's things that you want to do. There's things that uh, you hope to do. Uh, there's a type of teammate you strive to be. There's a type of player that you strive to be. And uh, we do, you know, we don't have full control over everything, but we do have control over our, our effort and the energy we put into trying to do that and create that, um, that story. So I thought that was, that was nice. I heard that one kind of later. And I mean, I know it's not like super like groundbreaking, but it's, it's a nice one for young athletes to hear is you do have a say in it and you can go get it if you want to. All right. Well, we'll talk thank you so much. Ah! Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to unmute all of you guys if you want to. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can leave. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there's some, good, there's some good questions here. Bye. Yeah, there were a lot of really good questions. That was awesome. Uh, probably didn't ask like 15. <laughs> no, there was no, there's no, a lot of them. Um, no, I, yeah, but I also got messages on the side. Oh, you uh, did? Oh, I didn't. You got private messages on the side. They did COVID. They did so well. Yeah, that was awesome. Comment. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> No, you're awesome, Tom. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. You should be like a public speaker or something. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. a public speaker on Zoom. Yeah. Is there such thing as zero digging or passing too much? Uh -huh. Would you ever yeah, change yeah, anything? All those questions. I was like, there's so many. Yeah, yeah. when you're like, done, can you tell? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. There's one about uh, uh, if you're better than Brent or not in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> She's definitely better. No. <laughs> I see about, it. What's Jenna like in college? <laughs> What was I like? Oh. No, don't talk about that. <laughs> Who has that one? We didn't get that right? part. Of it. But, uh, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of questions here. Nathan and Taylor, that was a good question. That was good stuff. <laughs> Do I need to start booting some people who are not paying attention? You can probably yeah. start recording, Rafi. Huh? You can take off the recording now. Yeah, I probably should. Yeah, stop.